Good afternoon. Welcome to NASA headquarters and today's uh, pre-launch briefing for the Gravity Probe B mission. The, uh, the launch is scheduled for April 17th at 1.09 p.m. Eastern Time from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Here to tell us about the mission and the interesting science that we're going to uh, be hearing about today uh, from the mission, we have our panel. Uh, and leading off the panel will be Dr. Ann Kenny, who's the Director of the Astronomy and Physics Division here at NASA headquarters. Next will be Rex Jevenin, the Program Manager for Gravity Probe B and the Deputy Director for National NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Following him will be Professor Francis Everett, Principal Investigator for Gravity Probe B from Stanford University in California. Following him will be Professor Brad Parkinson, the co-principal investigator for Gravity Pro B, also from Stanford. And then we will hear from Professor Kip Thorne, the Feynman Professor of Theoretical Physics from the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena. And we'll start with Dr. Kenny. Thanks, Don. Well, in about two weeks, we'll be uh, launching Gravity Pro B. And uh, I think of Gravity Pro B basically as a space-time machine that is designed to test Einstein's general theory of relativity. You might ask why we need to test Einstein's theory. Uh, and I would say that fundamental science provides the underpinning of much of our modern science and technology. And the better we can measure and understand these effects, the better we can shape the world that we live in. So Einstein predicts that space and time are both warped and dragged by the presence of our own massive and rotating Earth. And Gravity Probe B will test this prediction. Uh, Gravity Probe B studies very fundamental questions, and it does it in a very simple manner. And of course, the simpler something, it, it, the more simple something is, the more difficult it is. Uh, and I would say that was the case with Gravity Probe B. Um, Gravity Probe B represents a long relationship between Stanford and NASA. This was a project that was discussed initially only a few years after the formation of NASA between Stanford and NASA. It has been funded as a research project since 1963 and as a flight mission since 1994 and represents a long and fruitful relationship. Um, before turning it over to Rex, I'd like to give you a few superlatives of this mission that has been so challenging, that is going to test something so fundamental. Um, first, this will be the most accurate test of Einstein's theory. Second, this is the longest lived mission at NASA. Uh, third, this is the quietest environment ever produced, and for those of us that live in Washington, D.C., we think that's really, really valuable. Uh, third, uh, Gravity Probe B has produced the most perfect spheres ever made, and you are going to see some of these today. Uh, next, it has produced the most graduate students ever in the building of a space mission. And last, um, I think not least, uh, this will be the largest thermos bottle ever flown in space. <laughs> so with those superlatives for a mission that I fully expect to launch and be fully successful, uh, let's turn now to Rex and hear some of the programmatics and flight details of Gravity Probe B. Thank you, Ann. At 10.09 a.m. plus 12 seconds on April 17th, NASA will launch the historic Gravity Probe B mission from Space Launch Complex 2 at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. A Delta II launch vehicle will place the Gravity Probe B experiment into a polar circular orbit at an altitude of about 640 kilometers. And from this location in space, the Gravity Probe B experiment will look into the fabric of space-time to test Einstein's formulation of gravity. As of yesterday, GPB sits atop the Delta II launch vehicle and uh, is over at the launch pad. A uh, point was made earlier that it's already 150 feet off the ground, so we're encouraged. Uh, the space vehicle, which you see pictured here in my first slide, weighs some 3,300 kilograms, which is about 7,000 pounds. It is about 22 feet from stem to stern and about 10 feet in diameter. It just fits inside the payload fairing of a Delta II and it is about the size of a delivery van, all told. At the heart of the, at the, heart of the experiment are four tiny ping-pong-sized gyroscopes 
that Dr. Kenny mentioned earlier. These are these gyroscope rotors are used to make the, the gravity probe beam measurement, and they are immersed in a bath of superfluid liquid helium and are maintained at a temperature of 1.8 kelvins throughout the duration of the mission, which is about 18 months. That's about 450 degrees Fahrenheit below zero. The spacecraft flies in a drag-free orbit, and what that means is that the gyroscope rotor is literally in free fall about the Earth, and the spacecraft flies around the gyro. You'll hear more about that from Professor Parkinson in just a minute. Once on orbit, the spacecraft is controlled from a mission operations center at Stanford University. It's called the MOC, the Mission Ops Center. Uh, and the mission is divided conceptually into three different phases. The first phase is an initialization phase, which lasts about 60 days. And in that phase, the, instrument is, uh, the instrumentation is activated, the guide star is acquired, the orbit is trimmed, the gyroscopes that are there are suspended and spun up and aligned with the guide star. In other words, the experiment is made ready to do the measurement. It takes about two months. The second phase of the mission is called the science operations phase. This lasts about 13 months to allow the sun conceptually to walk all the way around the space vehicle in the course of a year. And in this case, uh, in this phase of the mission, the gyroscopes uh, should be functioning normally, and this will be the science mode. The third phase is post-mission calibration. This is the final two months of the mission before the cryogen boils off. And this is the phase in which the science team undertakes the final calibrations for the instrument. Uh, the, mission's opera the mission operations team is a, uh, is qu is a, is a team comprised of, of elements from NASA, and from Stanford and from Lockheed. We have a combination of experienced uh, flight controllers, uh, flight directors, and mission directors from all, from all three of those elements of the team. We have a short animation now to show you the launch and the orbit insertion and the guide star acquisition for Gravity Probe B. So if you could start the animation. Here we see uh, Delta II liftoff. This is the same type of configuration that will be launching Gravity Probe B. It's a Delta 7920 configuration. That means it has uh, nine solids around it. You can see the, st the solids peeling off, the graphite epoxy motors uh, coming off the vehicle as it, as it races toward the, the altitude, which will be uh, 600, 640 kilometers. Um, once it reaches altitude, it will maneuver to, uh, to put the upper stage uh, into a place where it can circularize the orbit. Now you see the upper stage separation and the payload fairing. Now the payload fairing will separate at this point and now you can see the Gravity Probe B space vehicle with the solar arrays undeployed. The upper stage is now orienting it so that it starts out pointed toward the guide star, which you hear a little bit about later. And now the, the upper stage separates and GPB is set spinning with the solar arrays deployed in a power positive orientation and starts, to, and, and starts to acquire data. There on the horizon you can see the guide star and GPB rotates and points to that guide star throughout its entire mission uh, as it circles around the Earth for 18 months. Uh, in summary, the GPB team is ready to perform this launch and anticipating a successful mission. Um, I want to add the fact that this point in, uh, in, the, this point in, the, in the development being, being at the point of launch, it's a testament not only to the ingenuity of this team and, and also the talent of this team, but finally, it's a, it's a testament to really the perseverance of the team because this has been a long mission development and uh, the team has shown extraordinary will in the, in the course of getting this done. And I will turn it now over to Professor Francis Everett, who is the principal investigator for Gravity Probe B and is the person who personifies the, deter the determination of the Gravity Probe B team. So, Francis. Thank you, Rex. Well, this, of course, is a wonderful time for us at Stanford and our colleagues at Marshall, NASA Marshall Center and NASA headquarters and also at Lockheed Martin. It's great to be beyond the point of building to the point of actually launching. People sometimes ask, you know, why have you felt you should persist in this way to perform a test of Einstein? Aren't Einstein's theories all established and confirmed. After all, it was 50 years ago that Einstein himself died, and it's 100 years next year when he developed his first theory of relativity. Don't we already know it all? And the answer is no. Uh, the theory that Einstein first developed, his special theory of relativity, in 1905, solved a very deep problem in physics. It managed to show how to reconcile Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism, which theory, by the way, is 
the cause of our being here, since it was a theory that predicted the existence of radio waves 27 years before they were discovered, with Newton's mechanics. And that had to be done not by altering Maxwell's ideas, but by altering Newton's ideas. It was very striking. And as soon as Einstein had finished that, got physics out of one fix, he realized it was in another fix, which was you now had to modify the theory of gravitation. And it took Einstein 10 years to develop his next theory in 1915, 1916, which is his theory of gravitation, which is what we are going to be testing. We call it his general theory of relativity. So now he got us out of two fixes, and I won't be saying very much about it, but he actually landed us in a third one, which is that theory is very difficult to re reconcile with quantum mechanics. But I'll leave that, and maybe Kip Thorne may want to say something about that. Now, this theory, although there are some very important tests that have been made, is much less established experimentally than special relativity is. So let's now have my first graphic, please, and we'll look at what gravity probe B is going to do. And in one sense, it's hard to imagine a simpler experiment. We have a star, which we are pointing at. We have a gyroscope. Now, this gyroscope is a sphere, a spinning sphere, and we'll talk a little bit more about this spinning sphere. So, it consists of a gyroscope, which is a spinning sphere, a telescope looking at a star, and a star. And that's the total experiment, and we're going to look and ask ourselves what happens. Leonard Schiff predicted, on the basis of Einstein's theory, two effects which rejoice in the name of the geodetic effect. If you have a satellite in orbit around the Earth, what Einstein's theory says is that space is slightly curved. Now, that sounds a bit mystical. Actually, it's a lot less mystical you, you can think. Draw a circle in space, and we know the circumference of the circle is 2 pi times the radius. But is that true around the Earth? Actually, it isn't. You would find, if you could measure the radius and the circumference, there would be a small defect, which I like to call the missing inch. The circumference would be one inch less than two pi times the radius. And indirectly, though very directly indirectly, that's what gravity probe B will measure with its geodetic measurement, a change in direction and spin of the gyroscope in the plane of the orbit. And Kip will actually show you a little bit later on how that works. The second and even more surprising effect is that as the Earth rotates, it drags space and time around with it and will therefore drag a gyroscope around with it. And because of the fact that space is being dragged, we call that the frame dragging effect. And you'll see if you look at the, uh, the graphic that the two effects turn out to be at right angles. But they require a gyroscope that is more than a million times as accurate as the best inertial navigation gyroscopes. And the only reason why this can be done is by going into space, where you gain a number of very important advantages. So what is the gyroscope? If you could maybe focus in on it and we see it a little closer. It is a sphere the size of a ping pong ball which is one and a half inches, by the way, is the size of a ping pong ball, round to better than a millionth of an inch, made of glass, fused quartz, a special, very uniform kind of glass, coated with a thin layer of a metal, niobium, and all this is run at very low temperatures. And you then ask yourself the following interesting question. How do I measure with extreme accuracy the direction of spin of a perfectly round, perfectly uniform sphere with no marks on it? And the way in which we do it is, I mentioned it was coated with uh, one of these metals which at low temperatures becomes a superconductor. When a superconductor spins, it develops a magnetic pointer in it, which therefore tells us the direction of spin. It's exactly aligned with the spin axis of the gyroscope. That effect which is called the London moment, and we have a very accurate device, a squid so superconducting quantum interference device to measure 
the direction of spin. So let us have my second graphic, please. This shows you the essence of gravity probe B, which, as I said, is very simple. There is a guide star. There is a telescope. There is not one gyroscope, but four gyroscopes. So we get four independent measurements of the two Einstein effects. These all go in this large thermos bottle. And there we are. And it's going to be a very dull experiment one that's got going. It'll be just slowly rolling about the line of sight to the star and measuring a small change of angle, but we hope it'll be a very exciting change of angle. So I'd make two more points. I'm a physicist, but this is the kind of experiment that couldn't conceivably have been done by physicists alone. Right from the start, it's been based at Stanford University and elsewhere on physics engineering collaboration. And as Ann Kinney said, one of the exciting things is the enormous participation of students. And a total of 78 PhDs at Stanford, undergraduate students. We've even had some very interesting contributions by high school students. But with that, I'd like to leave that and pass to my engineering colleague, Professor Parkinson. Ah, thank you. Thank you, Francis. Um, as Francis has mentioned, this test of general relativity is very simple in concept, but when you get down to the technology and the details of how to do it, it's, uh, I think, a, a testimony to perseverance, to say the least. The execution is more challenging in part because we have to hold many things near zero, and one of those things that we are holding near zero is acceleration, and by that we mean it is drag-free. We compensate for any pressure on the satellite, and we do that by chasing the second gyro, and we chase it to an accuracy about the tenth the thickness of a human hair, and I'll like to describe how we do it in a little more detail in just a minute. I like the first graphic. We've mentioned the fact that we have this device called a doer, a large thermos bottle. Our experiment fits right down in the center of that large device. It is filled with superfluid helium, a liquid. And if you think about putting this liquid in space, you right away realize as the liquid boils off to maintain us at 1.8 degrees Kelvin, a great problem arises because of the tendency to blow the liquid right straight out as you're boiling off. Instead, we invented something called a porous plug. The porous plug is a device that actually sweats. And it allows the gas to get out while maintaining the liquid inside, much as the skin of your body does. A very interesting development. But you also worry about the helium that's coming off, because, of course, that creates thrust. And I'll say a word about that in just a minute. Now, Francis has already pointed out our gyroscope. We think they're quite beautiful. It's all made of fused quartz, a type of glass. And it's contained in a housing, which is also made of fused quartz, beautifully machined and coated with niobium so that it can be suspended and tested on the ground. And in turn, the two of these go together in interlocking fashion. And then you attach a bunch of wires and cables to suspend and read it out. And you end up with one of our four gyroscopes. Now, one of the complications, Francis, the physicists invent these ways of reading things out, such as magnetics, magnetic pointers turns out the pointer is very tiny. And for it to read out effectively, we have to eliminate all magnetic fields. The next graphic shows one technique we use to do that. In this graphic, we're staring down into the heart of the doer. And the silver thing you see there is a practical use for a lead balloon. It is actually a superconducting, expanded lead balloon. It turns out lead goes superconducting at these temperatures. And a superconductor offers an excellent shield to magnetic fields. As a matter of fact, we shield any changes in magnetic field to an, uh, a, an attenuation factor of a million times a million, 10 to the 12th. There are many system engineering changes as well, and I'd like to just mention two of them. Uh, the first is shown here. I showed you the gyro with all of its wires. If I could have the next graphic. This is a very small part of this story. There's over 400 wires and cables. So here we are trying to maintain a 
payload at 1.8 degrees Kelvin. At the same time, we have all these paths, these conduits for heat down into the door. And it turns out there's a whole other story about how that is done. But the system engineering associated with heat stations, et cetera, has been very, very uh, important to get us our 18 months of life. Let me turn to a second system engineering challenge. I mentioned that the uh, doer is outgassing. It's letting helium off. And if we let it simply do it willy-nilly, we would disturb our pure gravitational orbit. Instead, that helium is captured in this device. This is one of 16 micro thrusters. Micro in the sense that it doesn't put out a lot of thrust. The helium gas is captured here and then fed out through this nozzle. These thrusters operate at what I call 1 50th of a breath. When you breathe out, you are actually causing a reaction on your body. You don't feel it very much, but it's there. It turns out this is 1 50th of that, and this allows us to maintain the orbit within the precision that I uh, mentioned er er earlier. There are many other system engineering challenges. I think, however, I'd like to just reiterate three keys to this development. The first is 30 years of technology, over 30 years of technology development, you know, with many of the brightest minds, the brightest students we could find. The second is solving these intricate system engineering problems. And the third, I think, is tenacity. It is the persistence of particularly Francis Everett and the team of physicists and engineers that he assembled around him who simply wouldn't give up. And I'm very proud to see that spacecraft sitting on top of that booster today. I'd like to now turn it over to Professor Kip Thorne of Caltech. Thank you, Brad. <clears throat> so Einstein's general relativity tells us that there are three aspects of warped space-time. <clears throat> There's a warping of space, which we have measured with rather high precision in the solar system already. There's a warping of time, that is, time slows down near massive bodies. That has also been measured with rather high accuracy. And then the third aspect is that the spin of the Earth or the Sun or any other body drags space into motion around itself like the air in a tornado. And that we have never seen in any definitive way. There have been hints of observations of it, but nothing definitive and clean enough to say that you have really seen it, and absolutely nothing that is quantitative. And the principal goal of Gravity Probe B, in my mind, is to see that effect, to measure it with high precision, to verify that the amount of dragging that is created is directly proportional to the spin angular momentum of the central body to find out what the proportionality constant is. Uh, now, let me explain these three aspects of warped space-time in the context of a black hole, because what we are, our goal is to see quantitatively in the solar system and verify general relativity with regard to all three aspects of warped space-time so that we then can be able to understand definitively how these same phenomena are occurring in the distant universe in, uh, and doing major things in the distant universe. So uh, I brought my favorite black hole with me. Uh, and uh, this black hole uh, is actually made out of warped space and time, not out of rubber despite appearances. Uh, so if you take an equatorial slice through that black hole, you might have expected it would have the same geometry as a flat sheet of paper. But in fact, it doesn't. Uh, the circumference around that slice would be uh, much uh, smaller than you would expect, based, or the diameter would be much larger than you would expect based on the circumference. And the next, uh, uh, my first graphic illustrates that. In this first graphic you see in this trumpet horn shape, it's a actually an exact depiction of the warped space around a black hole, the equator equatorial slice through it. This is uh, as seen by a hyper being in hyperspace in which our warped universe uh, is embedded. Uh, this is the language a science fiction writer uses. Uh, it's our universe is curved in hyperspace. You also see two other features here. Uh, well, let me say, the, the horizon of the black hole, the surface is down at the very bottom. It's a circle at the very bottom because I've suppressed one dimension. We're only looking at the equatorial slice. And uh, d down near the horizon, uh, the color coding shows red going to black. And this is depicting the warping of time. The flow of time is slowed near the horizon. 
right, actually to a halt right at the horizon. As you move back away from the horizon, uh, the rate of flow of time picks up, and that's shown by the colors of the rainbow as you go to the violet very far away. The third aspect of the warping depicted on there is the whirling motion of space around the horizon. Space is moving uh, at a very high clip uh, in the vicinity of the horizon, as indicated by the long uh, white arrow. As you go farther up the cone, uh, or up the trumpet horn, away from the horizon, the uh, angular momentum of space, or angular velocity of space's whirl gets slower and slower and slower. It, in fact, uh, once you're away from the vicinity of the horizon, it is predicted to be, uh, be obey an inverse cube law. The angular velocity of whirl of space goes as the inverse cube of distance uh, from the body, uh, and it's proportional to the spin angular momentum of the body. Uh, so let me talk now about the attempts to measure these three aspects of warped space-time in the solar system. Let's begin with the warping of space. This thing is no longer a black hole, it's now the sun. And uh, in 1976, there was a landmark experiment in which uh, the Earth was over here, Mars was over there, the Viking spacecraft was in orbit around Mars, and radio signals were sent out from the Earth to the Viking spacecraft and, to, uh, trans, and uh, transponded back to the Earth. Those radio signals had encoded on them a digital code so that uh, one could measure the, uh, the round triple travel time for a piece of the radio signal to go out and come back. Uh, and uh, Einstein insists, uh, his theory insists that the speed of propagation of electromagnetic signals is an absolute constant. So by measuring the round trip travel time, one was actually measuring the distance between the Earth and the Viking spacecraft in orbit around Mars. Now, in my next graphic, I show what the warping of space di uh, did to uh, that distance. Because space was warped uh, uh, in the vicinity of the sun, the distance traveled uh, was predicted to be uh, at w when the signal was coming the cl at its closest point to the edge of the sun. It was predicted to be 37 kilometers longer than you would have expected. That's 37 kilometers out of 378 million kilometers. So it's a small effect. But uh, the precision of the measurement was 37 meters. That is, to a part accuracy of a part in a thousand, it was verified that uh, the uh, w space is warped, as indicated in the diagram. And because the Earth and the Moon moved in their orbits, uh, it, uh, it was possible to monitor that mar warping as the uh, trajectory of the radio signals moved close to the sun and then away. So it was possible to actually map out the, the warping of space and verify that it was just uh, to this very high precision of a part in a thousand of what you would expect. Now, gravity probe B is going to measure that warping of space to higher precision than this uh, landmark experiment, if at least a factor of 10 higher, perhaps more. And we can understand how gravity probe B does that uh, in the language of uh, the missing inch that Francis Everett described. So here is the plane of the orbit uh, going around uh, the Earth, which is down at the center. And if the, plane, if the orbital plane were absolutely flat, uh, like this sheet of paper, then the gyroscope would point always in the same direction as it goes around and comes back to where it started, around and around, always pointing toward the guide star up here. But in fact, there's the missing inch. And so we can, uh, we cut, we can remove that missing inch by cutting this sheet down those uh, lines and pasting it together to form a cone. That cone is actually tangent to the warped surface, the bowl-like surface that I showed you in, in the graphic. So here is that cone, and it's easy, pretty easy to see what's going to happen on that cone. Uh, on that cone, uh, and you see it is, it is a cone, uh, you, uh, start, you start out uh, with, the, uh, gyro, uh, 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 with, with the gyro pointing in this direction, and you carry it around. This is identically the same set of arrows as on the previous diagram. And you come back, and it has turned. It's turned because of the missing inch. So you can do that yourself. You can just draw this, draw this uh, sheet on here and then cut out the cone, paste it together, and you see the turning of the gyroscope. So that is the uh, so-called, that's the principal cause of the so-called geodetic precession. 
The next graphic I want to discuss the precession due to frame dragging. Oh, oh no, I guess I back back off. So this graphic was uh, to uh, to describe the past measurement of warping of time uh, in the solar system. This was Gravity Probe A. You may have wondered what Gravity Probe A was. We keep talking about Gravity Probe B. Gravity Probe A in 1976, a, a set of, uh, of atomic clocks were launched to a height of 10,000 kilometers above the Earth uh, in a rocket. An identical set of atomic clocks down at the Kennedy Space Center was ticking away and the ticking rates of the clocks in the rocket were telemetered back down to the surface of the Earth at, in order to compare the rate of flow of time at 10,000 kilometers height versus the rate of flow of time on the Earth. The prediction was that time should flow more slowly on the Earth by four parts in 10 billion. And the measurement verified that, and it verified it to uh, one part in 10,000, a beautifully accurate measurement of a tiny effect, but an effect which is enormously large around black holes. Um, so in the next graphic, uh, then, we'll talk about the measurement of the dragging of space into motion by the spin of the Earth. So this Earth spins uh, on its axis at one revolution uh, per day. And that angular momentum of the Earth, then, in the immediate vicinity of the Earth, uh, drags space into motion with an uh, angular velocity of one revolution in six million years. A tornado-like motion, but a very weak tornado. Uh, it obeys an inverse cube law. It, uh, the, that angular velocity is out as the inverse cube of distance from the Earth, Earth's center. Uh, that motion, uh, if you come back on, on to the, bring the cameras back onto me, that motion takes hold of the gyroscope uh, and the whirling motion of the uh, of space around the Earth grabs the gyroscope and causes the gyroscope to change its spin axis. It, like a straw floating on the surface of a river, where the river flows faster near the center and slower near the bank, the straw will turn, and it's precisely the same thing going on here. Space moves faster near the Earth and slower farther away, and the spin axis of the gyroscope turns. Let me just wind up by making a few remarks about the significance of uh, this uh, wonderful measurement that we expect to be done uh, for astrophysics and cosmology. Suppose that the entire universe were rotating rigidly instead of being non-rotating, instead of just expanding. Suppose that in addition to expanding, it were rotating rigidly. Uh, how would we know? Well, you might say, well, we would know because we have our gyroscopes here and we see that uh, the stars move relative to the gyroscopes. But that's not the way it works. In general relativity, the angular momentum, basically, associated with all that motion of all the mass in the universe would drag space into a rotational motion near the Earth, and the gyroscope would move right with the, with the rest of the uh, universe. And so it, it would not be possible to have the gyro fail to point at the fixed stars unless you have the Earth nearby spinning and influencing the pointing direction of the gyroscope more strongly than the rest of the universe is. This is called Mach's principle, that inertia here is determined by the rotational state of the rest of the mass in the universe. Um, this effect of, uh, of the dragging of space into motion is terribly important in astrophysics around black holes. And if I could have my last graphic. Um, so here we see a black hole as the dot at the center, an accretion disk of gas orbiting around the black hole, and uh, it, that accretion disk is forced into the black hole's equatorial plane, it turns out, by the dragging of space into motion, a huge effect near the black hole. Uh, you see jets shooting out from the vicinity of the uh, black hole along the spin axis. And what is it that tells the jets what direction to point? It is precisely the dragging of space into motion. That's the only way that the black hole can communicate to the external universe what is the direction of its spin axis. In addition to that, it turns out that that dragging of space interacting with magnetic fields generates the enormous power that comes off in those jets. And so this frame dragging is terribly important in, uh, in the physics of black holes as well as in cosmology. And what gravity probe D B will do for us is it will, one, for the first time verify under controlled circumstances here in the solar system, one, that the, this effect exists, and two, it will tell, verify 
that it is uh, directly proportional to the angular momentum of spin of the Earth with, and we'll verify the proportionality constant so that we have that as a landmark here in front of us when we go out into the external universe to interpret our astrophysical and cosmological observations. All right. Uh, thank you, panelists. Uh, we will uh, start with um, questions uh, from reporters here at NASA headquarters and then go to uh, some of our centers with reporters. Uh, please, if you indicate if you want to have a question, we'll start down here in the front. And give us your name and affiliation. Please, uh, Charles Seif, Science Magazine. Are there any variations on Einstein's theory that give a consistent picture without the lens theory effect? Or is it, uh, are all mathematical uh, variations, uh, including the frame dragging effect? So uh, you, can, you can readily invent a theories of gravity that have no frame dragging. However, if you then demand, check them uh, with regard to whether they viol violate other experiments that have already been done, the answer is they generally do. Uh, this is, and, and so uh, other experiments, uh, uh, experiments are generally interpreted within the framework of what are, what's, what's called metric theories of gravity. And within the framework of metric theories of gravity of a somewhat limited class uh, that uh, appear in the so-called parametrized post-Newtonian description of metric theories of gravity, within that uh, framework, uh, uh, the fact that the other experiments have been done and have given the measurements at, at, at the accuracy that they have, uh, that they give, that till uh, within that framework, that says that this frame dragging should be there. However, I believe, and I think all, most all of my colleagues believe, that if general relativity fails, it will fail in a non-metric way. That is. Uh, in, in ways that don't, don't, that don't fall within this class where the statements that I've described for you are true, such a failure would have tremendous consequences uh, for fundamental physics. And uh, what we are going after with gravity probe B in terms of uh, search for any deviation of frame dragging from general relativity's prediction is uh, a, a search for whether or not the foundations are there. Is it? Is gravity really a metric theory or not? Is is in some sense what's what's being probed? Yeah. Follow up or any other questions here at headquarters for now? Okay, we'll go to uh, Marshall Space Flight Center, followed by the AIM Research Center. Uh, Marshall, go ahead. Please uh, give us your name and affiliation. Kent Falk with Birmingham News. Uh, this question is for uh, Mr. Gevin. Um, could you explain Marshall's role in this, the uh, number of folks involved with that here, and also the um, importance of, that Speed Ring played in this? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, the Marshall Space Flight Center's role is that we've uh, managed the program for the Office of Space Science here at NASA headquarters, and that program management role involves a number of different things. Uh, uh, but principally, it has to do with uh, with managing the schedule and the technical aspects of the program on behalf of the agency. Uh, it has involved about, uh, at the present time, it involves about 35 civil servants at, at NASA Marshall and, and about an equal number of support contractors. We, um, the Speedring Corporation was responsible for doing a lot of the machine work, the exquisite machine work that you see on the glass that Professor Professors Parker, uh, Parkinson and Everett showed. They did the machine work for the gyroscope rotors and also for the gyroscope housings and then for the quartz block which contains the four gyroscopes and then a, a lot of most of the machining except for the fine polishing on the telescope quartz. So Speedring had a very, very important role in manufacturing some of the components. If I might just add a thing, Rex. Um, the technique for making the spheres was originated at Marshall Center very successfully, and the machines which we finally made them at Stanford were actually built at Marshall Center. So that's a point not to be forgotten from earlier times. Thank you. We'll now go to the AIMS Research Center in California for questions. Go ahead, please. Hi, my name is Claudia Cowan. I'm with Fox News Channel. Uh, th my question is for uh, Professor Everett. Um, some critics have suggested that uh, there has never been such an experiment in which there may not be a payoff and that four decades and $700 million is hard to justify. Can you respond to those criticisms? Okay. 
Well, it's possible to criticize any space program, you know. I mean, I think that Gravity Probe B is a very important experiment, but I have no wish to predict the results of Gravity Probe B other than that we will make a superb, accurate measurement of two very fundamental consequences of general theory of relativity. We are experimentalists. Physics is an experimental subject, and one must stick with that fundamental truth. So one does not agree with the critics. May, may I comment? <clears throat> Just a bit. So this is Kip Thorne. Um, suppose that we were in a position where we had seen electric fields and electric forces, but we had never ever seen a magnetic field or a magnetic force. And suppose that our theory of electromagnetism was sophisticated enough that we knew that uh, there had to be a magnetic force if there was an, ele an electric force, but we'd never ever seen it. I would not feel at all comfortable with the theory until I had actually seen that magnetic force even though I believed that elsewhere in the universe it, pl uh, it was there and it was playing an important role. If I hadn't seen it under controlled circumstances where I could uh, probe how it behaves, uh, I, I would feel as a physicist extremely uncomfortable and extremely unhappy about uh, the, uh, my level of confidence about fundamental physics. And that's precisely the situ situation that we are in. We've seen three aspect, two of the three aspects of warped space-time. We've seen the warping of space and the warping of time. We have never seen, in any clean way, uh, uh, the dragging of space into motion by spin. Uh, and that actually turns out to be a close analog of uh, the magnetic field effect that would be produced by a rotating charged sphere. Uh, it's as though we'd never seen the magnetic field, and gravity probe B for the first time is going to show it to us. I have a follow-up again for Professor Everett. For, the, for people who are not involved in the scientific community, why should people care about this mission? How will the magic of science in what's happening here af affect them? How will they feel uh, and, and be impacted by these experiments? Well, I have two comments, and Brad Parkinson may want to add one on that very question. The first one is, you know, people phrase your question in various ways. They say, well, what interest is this to the ordinary American? And I believe we should not underestimate the curiosity and alertness of the ordinary American. You know, I can tell you a story of how on an occasion I was traveling back on a plane and I got talking to the man next to me who turned out to be a cop from Chico, California. And we got talking about life and things and I explained about spheres round to a millionth of an inch and gyroscopes and t testing Einstein and he got totally fascinated and then after a while he told me some things about being a police officer in Chico, California, which I wouldn't have thought of in advance. And you know, we shouldn't assume that people don't have curiosity about the universe. I think they really do. But Brad, you have some comments of along a slightly different line, which I would like to call on you to say more eloquently than I could. Oh, thank you. I I guess my observation would be as an engineer and as a practical person, I, not that physicists are not practical people, but uh, it strikes me that physics finds fundamental laws, and it is rare that the generation you're currently in has a direct benefit, but it is the sons and grandsons. And let me illustrate, Maxwell ex equations were discovered in the mid-1800s. My colleague here who's a biographer of Maxwell knows the exact date, I don't. But it wasn't until 40 to 50 years later that what they really meant in terms of practical engineering use, and I would contend we're sitting in this room surrounded by lights that are powered by electricity, we're using RF energy. It is the fundamental laws discovered by Maxwell that a half a century later resulted in the beginning of the most significant engineering achievement, which is electrification of the United States and the world. 
and I am not saying that just for myself, the National Academy of Engineering studied this and concluded that that was the number one achievement. And frankly, it dates back to a fundamental law of physics discovered by a physicist who at the time everyone said, so what? So I think it's for our grandchildren. This is Glenda Chu from the San Jose Mercury. Uh, Dr. Everett, you have um, over the years done an extraordinary job of answering critics and keeping this project alive and, and lobbying Congress and, and continuing to inspire people with the idea of this. And I wonder, you've talked a lot about what you've hoped to learn from the physics and what you've learned uh, about technology and engineering. I wonder what you could tell other scientists about how, how to do the politics of this, what, what it's, how, how to uh, defend your project and promote science politically to people in the Congress who might not have a scientific background. What, what worked for you? Well, I said that one should not underestimate the average American and his or her curiosity. Let me make the even more radical statement that one should not underestimate the average Congress person. I have found on my occasions of going out on the Capitol Hill, sometimes accompanied by Brad, that there is a genuine interest in trying to do the right thing on scientific programs. And you have to learn your way about. You have to learn that those people live in their world, which happens to be different from the world of an academic physicist. Sort of, to me, it was like visiting a strange foreign country, but that was something I also did when I left the United Kingdom 40 odd years ago and came to the United States. If I could add just one thing to that, I, I think the other aspect is the hallmark that epitomizes my esteemed colleague here, and that is perseverance. It is rare that you go in and deliver a message to someone and they get it the first time. You have to explain it, and of all the experiments I think we've ever, NASA's ever tried, this may be one of the harder ones to, to explain. But I know, for example, that Norm Mineta, who is currently the Secretary of Transportation, sat down with us one day for the better yeah, part well. of an hour, and he pretty well got it. He pretty well understood it. The thing he didn't understand is why a good Cal graduate like he was supporting a Stanford project. But other than that, he got it. Uh, I'd like to just add something to this uh, topic, and that is that um, NASA has a very strong engagement with the science community in the country. And we work uh, both on a decade to decade time scale and on a three year time scale very closely with the community to bring forth the most important science goals in the coming decade to prioritize them, to formulate them, and then to try to accomplishment, accomplish them. And that is, a, I think, a, an extremely important activity that brings science forward from the community. We have a, we have a science program here that really is, is built by the community, and I think that's a powerful way for the country to accomplish science. One more from Ames. Yes, uh, this is David Perlman from the San Francisco Chronicle. I'm not sure whether this goes to Professor Everett or Kip Thorne, but uh, when the Big Bang banged, and shortly thereafter, or relatively shortly, uh, the stars and galaxies formed, uh, was there a rotation of that early, early universe? And if so, uh, did this phenomenon of frame dragging and the dragging of space-time begin at that point, and, and how did it begin? Kip, I think this is your question. <laughs> well, on the basis of observation, we know that the universe was uh, very uniform, not perfectly uniform, but uniform to a part in a hundred thousand or so. Uh, uh, early on. Um, and so if it was rotating, it was rotating rigidly. Uh, and uh, the inertial frames at each point in the universe were determined by the motion of all the other matter in the universe, so that inertial frames were tied 
to the average non-expansion motion of the, of the matter. And so in a, you, you could say that uh, frame dragging was there and it was, it was forcing the inertial frames to do what they did, or you could say it wasn't there because uh, everything was just expanding, it wasn't rotating. It depends on your point of view. But the phenomenon of frame dragging as being produced by a spinning body was certainly there in the physical laws. And uh, once uh, stars had formed spinning, galaxies uh, had formed with some angular momentum, uh, black holes had formed spinning. Every time any object uh, was there spinning, frame dragging was going on. But it's so weak around uh, normal stars and galaxies that it has no terrible, terribly important consequences. Around black holes, it's enormously strong and has these huge consequences. So as soon as black holes were formed spinning, uh, frame dragging started playing a very major role. Uh, for example, as being the, uh, the nature's most uh, most effective way to store energy in the spin of the black hole, which is really the frame dragging, and then ultimately release it in, in jets uh, from black holes. Okay, we can uh, come back for any follow-ups here at headquarters. We'll start over here down in the front row. Go ahead. Charles Seif, Science Magazine. Um, why did you decide to go with physical spinning balls rather than something, an uh, interferometric gyro of some sort? We looked very thoroughly at different kinds of gyroscopes, and by far the best one for the purpose is a mechanical gyroscope. The reason for that can be understood in the following way. It is even true on the Earth, uh, from all my knowledge at least, that the most accurate gyroscopes are electrically suspended gyroscopes. When you go into space, you can gain an enormous improvement in performance of the gyroscope compared with Earth, because the limitations in Earth performance of such gyroscopes come from the forces of supporting it against gravity, and in a drag-free satellite of the kind that uh, Brad described, one has a reduction of maybe a factor of 10 to the 10th in all of those disturbances. There is no really similar significant improvement in, say, the performance of a ring laser gyroscope. And so the choice was absolutely clear. And from time to time, we have revisited this and looked at other kinds of possible gyroscopes. And we've always come back to that same conclusion. Frank. I'm Frank Mooring with Aviation Week. Um, if, I, if I read the press kit correctly, the expected measurements are very fine, very small changes in the direction of, of the gyroscopes. Um, if you see that after, and I, I take it this is over the, the, the period, the 13 month period. If you see that after 13 months, does that nail the theory? Or does it just, is it just another data point that needs to be checked again, and if so, how would you do that? I want to make no prediction whatsoever about the result of the experiment. From this point of view, we must be hard-headed experimentalists, making sure we do the experiment right. The to describe the results of gravity probe B as just another data point, however, is not the right way of looking at it. Uh, uh, one doesn't want to uh, claim things beyond uh, what we, until we've actually done it, but I believe this will be by far the most credible of any of the tests of general relativity in the variety of checks that it has when you have four independent gyroscopes which all have to give the same answer if the experiment is done right and when you have numerous c calibration tests on it a thing that we have done with gravity probe b which is on experimental basis incredibly important is the einstein effects are much larger than any of the known disturbing effects 
going back to the very beautiful work that has been done on the radar time delay, which Kip described, there one is looking at a 37 kilometer effect against an enormously larger background. In our case, we are going to be looking at Einstein effects in which the background disturbances are going to be five or six orders of magnitude smaller than this. So we must do the experiment and do it right, but I think it will be of extraordinarily strong test of the two effects. One thing that we haven't particularly emphasized here, but that I think really is interesting, is that if you look at the suite of 35 missions in the Astronomy and Physics Division, they are astronomical observatories, while this is a physical experiment. This is a physics experiment being carried on in space, and it is very different than the, the standard mission that we do in astronomy and physics. And my expectation, not to make a prediction, but my expectation is that this is going to be in all the in all the science books as the definitive uh, experiment. Follow up, Frank. If not, we'll uh, go back to the AIMS Research Center and pick up a, a follow up question there. Go ahead, please. Yes, this is David Perlman again. I did have a follow up, and the purpose of my first question was to ascertain whether this experiment will, in fact, prove of great importance in understanding the nature of the early universe, what it was like, uh, what effect the Big Bang had in producing uh, a universe full of galaxies, stars, and black holes. So I mean, that, that was the thrust of the question. So did you want me to expand on, expound on it further? Or I don't understand what you're, what you're asking now. Well, I'm trying to find out exactly, not necessarily exactly, I'm trying to find out whether this experiment uh, will produce a clearer explanation in any sense of the origin of the universe and the evolution of the early universe. It is not very directly related to the origin of the universe or the very early universe, except in the sense that I said that uh, that the fact that uh, th that the inertial directions uh, in the very early universe as today would have been determined by the average motion, average rotational motion of all the matter in the universe then, which was uh, which was so uniform, it was very regular. Uh, essentially rigid rotation, and inertia was tied to the rigid rotation, so there's no way to even measure the rotation. That's the only relevance to the very early universe. The real, the real relevance cosmologically and astrophysically is in Mach's principle, which I just described uh, for today or then, uh, but then in black hole physics uh, for uh, the, the tremendously large effects that come from the dragging of, uh, of space into motion around black holes. Uh, and other uh, dense bodies, such as neutron stars, where this effect uh, can be quite important for uh, some kinds of phenomena in neutron stars, but uh, not directly to the birth of the universe or the very early universe, aside from the Mach's principal issue. So this might be a nice opportunity to discuss LISA a little bit, which is a follow-on. I don't know if you'd exactly want to call it a follow-on mission, but it's certainly gravitational physics that we're working on and that uh, Kip, of course, knows a great deal about. Thanks. Uh, I, I actually have a follow-on graphic that, uh, that discusses this just a little bit. But let, let me, before we go to that graphic, if, uh, just, just uh, asking that you prepare for it. Um, so LISA is a uh, mission that will involve three drag-free spacecraft using the same kind of drag-free drag uh, techniques as uh, were uh, developed for Gravity Probe B, so it relies on Gravity Probe B technology in that sense and building on Gravity Probe B technology. These three spacecraft at the corners of a triangle, six million kilometer arms separating them, uh, and looking for waves of warped space and time. And so it's the three aspects of space-time warpage, warping of space, warping of time, and uh, dragging of space, but in a wave-like form propagating through the universe, uh, produced by different distant objects. 
Lisa will see primarily the effects of the warping of space. It's a stretching and squeezing of space, causing these spacecraft to move back and forth relative to each other as these waves go by. One of the objects that we will uh, study with Lisa is a big black hole with smaller object, a smaller black hole or a white dwarf or a neutron star going around the big black hole. As the big black hole spins uh, on its axis, and if the uh, smaller object is in an inclined orbit, as shown in the next uh, in my graphic, uh, that drags the orbit uh, into a uh, turning motion. And so you see the little black hole going around the big black hole uh, in its circular orbit. Each time it goes around the big black hole, you get an oscillation in, uh, of a stretching and squeezing of space of stretch and squeeze that's sh shown down at the bottom. So you see something going up and down in an oscillatory fashion. Each of those little wavelets going up and down, or each, uh, each up and down, is, is, it comes from the small black hole going around the big black hole. But then the dragging of space into motion by the big black hole causes a precession of the orbit. The orbit turns as shown by the red arrow, and that causes a modulation of the waves. And so you see this modulation. And so we, will, with LISA, will get very high precision measurements uh, through the modulation. We'll see very high precision measurements of the dragging of space, dragging, the space dragging, dragging that orbit. So if you come back to me, uh, you, you'll see the orbit go around, plane go around and around through those modulations. But only by virtue of gravity probe Bs having verified the relationship of spin angular momentum to the dragging of space and told us a, a yes, general relativity is correct about uh, that proportionality constant and it corrected it as the angular momentum that's doing this. And so we have a firm foundation for now interpreting these observations with gravity probe B having done the calibration in that sense. We can, we'll, with LISA then, when LISA flies, we will be able then to uh, interpret the observations when we see the modulation of these waves, we'll be able to interpret those observations and say there was a black hole. It was spinning at a certain spin rate, which we can infer from the observations, and uh, we can infer it with complete confidence because gravity probe B has shown us the relationship between spin angular momentum on one hand and uh, the dragging of space on the other hand. Thank you very much for being with us today uh, here at NASA headquarters and uh, our discussion on the Gravity Probe B mission, again, uh, scheduled for launch at uh, 1.09 p.m. Eastern or 10.09 p.m. Pacific time from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. And you can follow the progress of the mission and also get all the information and graphics about the Gravity Probe B mission at the website that should be coming up on the screen here. And uh, we will look forward to a good launch on April 17th. Thank you.